Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. We are live from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in Los Angeles, sitting down with a fantastic lineup of guests, including Mark Cuban, Walter Isaacson, and Discovery CEO David Zaslaw. But first, to our lead. Uber's boardroom holds a crucial meeting. This after months of internal battles at the company, with former Uber CEO Travis Kalanick grasping to any power he has left on the board. Here with the latest details on what exactly went down, what it means for the world's biggest startup going forward. We're joined by Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for Bloomberg, and Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Business Week. Eric, I got to start with you. I know you've been waiting for headlines out of this Uber board meeting. What do we know so far about what happened today? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'd much rather be there with the Van, at the Vanity Fair conference with you. Uh, they're fighting over, you know, what governance looks like and whether they can pass uh, this soft bank deal and start moving forward with that. The goal is to put the two together in a single vote, reform governance, sort of expand the board, and start moving on this potentially $10 billion share purchase from SoftBank and others. So it looks like, you know, something is likely to pass. I think the actual sort of terms are being negotiated, but the movement to one share, one vote, and other reforms seem likely at this point. It's a matter of sort of the exact terminology and provisions. The Vanity Fair Summit uh, is a reminder of how power can change hands so quickly. Max, just a year ago, Travis Kalanick was the signature guest on stage with Vanity Fair editor Graydon Carter, and yet the balance of, of power has shifted so dramatically, and yet we still have this big question of just how much power Travis Kalanick will hold on to. Right, and, and in all sorts of ways, Uber is sort of trying to clean up uh, I don't know if you'd call it the mess that that uh, Travis Kalanick made, or or maybe sort of tidy up things, loose ends. Uh, elsewhere, we're, we're seeing developments in this case uh, with Waymo, which is Google's uh, driverless car division, which was of course a big reason that he stepped down. Um, you know, new disclosures uh, that suggest that you know it, that things were pretty bad. That that that, that the case that Uber's been trying to make it it, it doesn't look super compelling. Um, also in London, you know, Uber's trying to get its license back. So so. So really, all over the world, the company is trying to just deal with the fallout of the past year. Let's hang on to this Waymo dispute, Eric. This uh, new details have come out of a confidential report that Uber commissioned into what happened uh, with the the acquisition of Auto. And you know, from what I understand, uh, there are some really fascinating, juicy details about how much cover up was involved among uh, the founders of, of Auto. Uh, from, from Travis Kalanick himself, right. but what is unclear is just how much Uber actually used any confidential information. Is that correct? Right. So I think if you're looking for evidence that Anthony Lewandowski, the founder of Auto, was, you know, destroying things he obtained from Google while Uber was looking into it, soliciting Google employees to work for a self-driving car project, this new report has a lot of evidence of that. You know, unfortunately for Waymo, they're going after Uber the company, not Anthony Lewandowski the person, in their civil suit. So the question is really whether Uber used the information that Lewandowski may have had and whether it ever came over to Uber and then whether it was used in any of its trade secrets. So that's really the question. It, you know, if you want evidence that Lewandowski sort of did some questionable stuff, I think this report has it. There's also a sign in the report that, you know, Travis may have said, you know, do what you need to do um, with, with that material. So there's going to be this question of, you know, whether Uber conveyed the right message about the handling of potentially stolen material from Google. So let's talk about the situation in London. Uh, CEO, new CEO Dara Khosra Shahi is there. No deal. As of yet, though, uh, he has struck a very contrite tone. The head of Uber's UK division has gone. Max, is this a sign that this might be a tougher fight than Uber had anticipated? So, you know, a couple of years ago, the conventional wisdom was that Uber had gone on this kind of campaign, which is managed uh, in part by David Plouffe, the, the former, uh, you know, campaign manager for the Obama campaign, and that they had basically legalized themselves, you know, in a whole bunch of cities. And, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of us thought, you know, that, that sort of phase of the company was over. But we're seeing is that all this political blowback against Uber is having repercussions in, in the individual markets in which it plays. So the, the regulators in London are reacting to basically news that was happening in the U.S. around Grayball, which was this 
program that Uber had used allegedly to sort of evade uh, police and regulators. And, and so it's, it's, it's basically like a political issue where, where Uber now has to say, no, 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 like, we are nice, we're not like that, you know, we're, we're turning a page. And that's part of the reason this thing that's happening in the board right now matters. It's another way for them to signal, uh, you know, to, to mayors and to governors all over the world that, that like, Uber has changed and that Uber is not, you know, the, the sort of steamrolling company that maybe you think of them as. Eric, you've maintained that you think Uber and London will be able to work it out. Do you still believe that after today? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, both sides seem to indicate there was a productive meeting. Um, and I just think the political backlash against London, if they banned Uber, both for the drivers and the riders, would be enormous. I mean, we saw this fight with Bill de Blasio in New York. It's one thing to signal that you're the type of leader willing to stand up to Uber optically, I think it's another to really kick them out. And we've, we haven't really seen that brave move. Of, co of course, Austin did it at one point, you know, before the sort of product got very serious there. But with London, it is one of Uber's top markets. And the idea that it's just going to disappear tomorrow, I think, would be a shock to people who live there and depend on it for their livelihood or to get to their job or to get around. We're talking about a huge number of cars. I mean, I think it's 40,000 cars. So that would be, you know, hugely disruptive for Uber's drivers, which is certainly going to help uh, the company politically. I, it's, it is, I, just to disagree with Eric a little bit, I mean, I think the, the politics have shifted since that de Blasio battle. Um, but, but Eric's absolutely right that, that it's, it's hard to imagine this ending with just a blanket ban. Uber will probably have to give a little bit. They'll, they'll kiss and make up, and we'll go back to normal. All right, more negotiations to come, to be sure. Eric Newcomer, Max Chafkin, Bloomberg, thank you so much to both of you for joining us. All right, coming up, we bring you coverage from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit. I sat down with investor Mark Cuban. We covered everything, politics, what's on his agenda right now, Bitcoin, Trump, of course. That's coming up, and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Fink, CEO of BlackRock, is weighing in on cryptocurrencies. Speaking to Bloomberg, Fink says there is potential in the industry, but it's heavily used for money laundering. Take a listen. When I think about most of these cryptocurrencies, it just identifies how much money laundering there is being done in the world, how much people are trying to move currencies from one place to another. Bitcoin was on the top of mind of another banker, Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein, who tweeted, still thinking about Bitcoin. No conclusion, not endorsing slash rejecting. Know that folks also were skeptical when paper money displaced gold. Remember, Bloomberg reported on Monday that the bank was exploring a Bitcoin trading venture. Well, here at the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in L.A., I sat down with outspoken owner of the Dallas Mavericks and AXS CEO Mark Cuban. I asked him about the recent uproar over the protests in the NFL. Take a listen. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. Look, the NBA and NFL are completely different. If, if, you know, pick any football team, you might recognize three players. The other 50 have no platform, no social media followings for the most part. And their only chance to make a statement about what's important to them is when the cameras are rolling and in unity. Basketball, LeBron James calls him a bum, and he has a bigger platform, right? So it, it's completely different. And um, what I said to our team was, if you have a message that you want to convey to our fans and the media, let's just say it. We'll put you on videotape. We'll say what's on your mind. If, you know, these types of protests that the NFL tried, does you, you don't you lose control of the narrative, and so it's not the right way so to do it. So you don't think they should have protested in that way? No, I'm not saying that at all, right? I'm all for civil disobedience, right? I think for the NFL it worked, right? Because it was their only opportunity to do that. They didn't have a platform otherwise. The NBA is completely different. We have a much stronger platform. We have a far better ways to communicate a message. Is this a battle that President Trump should be picking? No. 
But you know what? It's not. It, it's not about sports and politics because sports is pol part of politics. You know, you know, sports people, um, athletes, owners, whatever, endorse candidates, give money, etc. But come on. But that's who he is. Look, I. I to me, there's three Donald Trumps. There's the Donald Trump who's trying to be the president. There's the Donald Trump, the salesperson, and there's the Donald Trump, the Twitter troll, right? When he trolls on Twitter, he's fair game. Anybody can take a shot at him. When he's in campaign mode, you just ignore him. He's just selling. And when he's trying to do his job as president, hopefully you help the people who are around them to help them. I've I've worked with probably four now three-letter agencies and and done things for them that the president has no idea because you know that's what patriotic Americans do, and you just let him pretend to be president or do his thing and and you know hopefully the best happens you've made your political views very clear what are your biggest concerns about this administration um <laughs> i don't know that he just doesn't know what's going on right it's just not in him to make an effort to understand or learn and you know possibly it's because he's not capable possibly it's because it's not he's not willing um it's, I, I just don't. See, I don't think he has it in him. Does he make it through four years? I'd say 25% chance, maybe 30% chance he doesn't. Um, I'd probably be willing to bet against it. Not because he's going to do something just crazily wrong, even though sometimes it seems like it. But I think it's because he's oblivious to the institutions in government and oblivious to the laws and rules. And he'll do he'll do something and won't recognize that it's an impeachable offense. You recently bought a stake in Twitter, is that correct? I just bought some shares. Why? Why now? Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of artificial intelligence, and I think they're making some good moves. I mean, you, you, you see the evolution of the interface on both apps and the web, and I think they're, they're going in the right direction. Should Twitter kick Trump off the platform? Nah, you can't do that. Why not? Well, you know what? When, we're in a situation right now where politics is so tribal and our lives are so tribal that in that realm of people who really focus on politics, when you try to make some, make a dramatic move, you, you, you increase the amount of tribalism, right? So if you kick them off, all the Trump fans are going to go bananas, and that, that doesn't do any good for anybody. And he just goes to Facebook, and then you just have the same thing, or he just posts it on a website, or, you know, there's, there's a thousand ways to post digitally, and Twitter happens to be the only one he knows how to use, but I'm sure even he can learn how to use Facebook or something else. Twitter, Facebook, now Google via Gmail and YouTube are in the crosshairs of this Russia investigation, the spread of fake news and misinformation. What is their responsibility? Well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because for broadcast television, if you broadcast an ad that said, you swallow this penny and it'll cure every illness, right? You wouldn't be allowed to broadcast it. There are rules that prevent you from doing it. I think the same rules should apply to digital mm -hmm. um, marketing and digital ads. You can't knowingly accept take money from or broadcast um, false advertising. Yeah. And the same should apply to Facebook and, and um, Twitter. What about, that's advertising, what about content? Well, I mean, content, look, if you're, it's not content if you're trying to promote a specific agenda, right? It's marketing, and there's a big difference. Content can be fact, content be, can be opinion, but state its opinion, right? Or it's fact by state its reporting and have a reporter assigned to it. Otherwise, it's not, and, and particularly what we're seeing coming out when they're using retargeting, that's advertising. When you're, when you're in this particular case, they're posting it through the ad platform. If you're posting it through the ad platform, it can't be fake news. It's a misleading advertisement, and it's the responsibility of Facebook and Twitter to recognize this is an advertising platform. We can't allow fake ads to to be be you know hosted on our platform. Last question: sure. You've told Bloomberg you're considering getting into Bitcoin. Have you uh -huh. done so yet? And what do you think of people like Jamie Dimon saying it's a fraud? Um, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of assets that are just their values based off supply and demand. Mm -hmm. You know, most stocks, there's no intrinsic value because you have no true ownership rights, no voting rights. You know, you just have the ability to buy and sell those yeah. stocks. They're like baseball cards. Yeah. And I think Bitcoin's the same thing. It's its value is a function of supply and demand. It doesn't really do anything else. I have bought some. I bought it through um, an ETN based on a Swedish exchange because that gave me liquidity. As Pure Bitcoin? Um, pure Bitcoin, uh -huh. yeah. And um, I'm also involved with ICOs, actually token sales, uh -huh. because I think blockchain is a great platform for future technology, for future applications. There will, just like the net and streaming created um, multiple great companies, I think pl blockchain will as well. Um, I'm involved in something called Mer Mercury Protocol, just uh -huh. to disclose that I think is going to um, change the messaging, how block, it'll change messaging using blockchain. How big is your stake in um, Bitcoin? In Bitcoin? relatively small.
We'll have to leave it up to the imagination as far as what a small means to Mark Cuban. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban there. Uh, always great to have him here on the show. Coming up, we are going to be talking about Google and the tech giants now under a microscope as part of a wide-ranging investigation into how Russia used social media and the internet leading up to the 2016 U.S. presidential election. New details on the investigation into Google via Gmail and YouTube. Next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. wide-ranging investigation into how Russian-linked operatives harnessed social media during the 2016 U.S. election, lawmakers are focusing on Google services, including YouTube and Gmail. The Senate has called Google to testify on November 1st, along with executives from Facebook and Twitter. A House panel is focusing on any materials on Russian ad buying on Google, search engine manipulations, fake news, and the potential uses of YouTube and or Gmail. Joining us now is Bloomberg Tech's Mark Bergen, who covers all things Google. So Mark, what do we know about what Google has discovered so far and the action that they have taken? Uh, we know very little about both those things. Um, right now we know that they're called before Congress. Uh, it could be because you know, Congress has a sense that there's actually a kind of wider ranging uh, issues and that, that affect Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Google clearly has a lot more channels. Um, you know, YouTube is a, is a really big place for fake news and propaganda. It's not talked about as, as often as Facebook. Um, certainly search, and Gmail, hacking. Uh, but at this point, we don't know if Google's found any evidence. Uh, you know, after Facebook disclosed those 3,000 election-related ads, Google came out and said, we probed our system, and we didn't find any similar ad buying during the election on, on our properties. So talk to us about the Russia Today situation, because they've removed that, right, from the premium YouTube ad package? Right, and just to be clear, that they didn't take down Russia Today's YouTube networks at all and their channels, but which are what, the second biggest on Google Preferred, which is their package of premium, you know, high-end, is the, the best quality or, or the, the most popular YouTube videos, and they give it to advertisers that pay more to get their ads uh, to run up there. You know, this is a this is a tough issue for Google. Uh, they, it's a state-sponsored station, but so is Al Jazeera and so is BBC. You know, people that say that Russia Today actually produces um, pretty quality stuff, but the the you know, national intelligence agencies have, have called them uh, effectively like a Kremlin-backed organization. Uh, so I think Congress is looking in particular at, at Russia Today, and there, and there are probably other channels and outlets that they're, they're eyeing as well. And what about Gmail? How might Gmail in particular have been used here? Uh, right, we don't have any information on that right now. We know that you know there certainly are some high-profile attacks. Uh, the John Podesta hacking, where he was using a Gmail account and basically fell for a phishing scam. Uh, we re reported last week that Google is preparing to put out some new security tools, uh, a route that they say will be much more impenetrable to, to hacking and phishing, and they're marketing that directly to journalists and to political operatives. Uh, basically saying things like the Podesta hack wouldn't happen if you had this toolkit. Um, you know, it's been certainly a popular tactic for, for hackers in the past to do Gmail phishing and something that Google has been playing this cat and mouse, cat and mouse game for, for years. So, uh, you know, Google is now going to be testifying before Congress as are Facebook and Twitter. Do we know yet if, if Google is handing over any information, what kind of information has been requested, the same way that Facebook handed over all of those political ads? Uh, we don't know at this point. Um, we know that Facebook has shared information with Google. Uh, we know that in, you know, the development of, of fake news and propaganda, Facebook and Google, Google kind of play off each other. The stories that do really well on Facebook tend to do really well in Google search. Um, the tweets that you know, Google has an agreement to index uh, certain tweets, and so there's a lot of viral tweets that may appear top of search results. Um, so Congress may be looking at sort of the interchange there. Uh, we don't know if they're going to plumb the depths of, of Google's like fairly expansive online advertising network too. So unfortunately, we don't we don't have a lot of information right now. 
We know that in the aftermath of the Las Vegas shooting, that fake news, misinformation ricocheted across the internet, and right. Google, especially Google, apologized for it. They blamed it on the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any internal initiatives underway to make sure that things like that don't happen in the future? Uh, I mean, they have put in some protocols in place. You know, I think that was a really fascinating issue because the search term was around a, a particular name whose name is his name was not in any news prior to that. Uh, and what you saw was a very, it seemed like a very proactive campaign uh, based on 4chan and some of these corners of the web to spread lies about the guy with his name. And so what uh, Google's algorithm has basically a sensitivity and they, they weigh, this is a timely, a lot of people are searching for this person, so we're going to shoot something up to the top. I mean, they shot up um, you know, a website that clearly w w was not an established news place, and, and I think they've, they've they've put a lot of attention on this year. They're certainly trying to focus more. It's it's a hard problem because they're what you know historically Google has always said we want to get relevant information and timely information in front of people. All right, Mark Bergen. I know you will be getting us more details. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Bergen, who covers uh, Google for us. Thanks so much for that update. Coming up, much more from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit. We are live in LA. We'll be sitting down with Discovery CEO David Zaslav. That is next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. The mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, says she's hopeful President Trump and his White House have a better handle on the island's needs after visiting today. Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz is tweeting that the meetings between local officials and White House staff were, quote, productive. During a visit to Calvary Chapel in San Juan, President Trump met with residents who were picking up food and other supplies at the church. Various signs in the church read proud Americans let's make Puerto Rico great again and God bless you Mr. President. At least 45 people remain in critical condition in Las Vegas area hospitals which were overwhelmed after Sunday night's mass shooting at an outdoor music festival. 59 people were killed more than 500 others were injured. People took to the streets of Barcelona today to protest the use of force by police that left hundreds injured during this weekend's disputed referendum on the region's succession. Highways were blocked, schools closed, and businesses were halted across Catalonia as workers and students joined strikes. I'm Mark Crumpton. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 8.30 Wednesday morning in Sydney, where my colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, New Zealand's been trading for about uh, 30 minutes on Wednesday morning, uh, currently off just a few points, uh, well, let's call it flat. Uh, and this is after U.S. equities added to records, uh, car sales boosted industrials, and uh, oil held above $50 a barrel. ASX futures also pointing higher by about a quarter of 1%, iron ore stable at $62 per tonne, although that is to be expected uh, with China's markets on a holiday all week. Uh, the Aussie dollar briefly dipped below 78 cents again overnight before recovering. We've got Nikkei futures up a tenth of 1% as we wait on PMI services and composite PMI for September. Elsewhere, the Reserve Bank of India holds its meeting today. Uh, the cash rate there is expected uh, to be held lower for longer. So uh, that's the only central bank action we have uh, for you today. As I mentioned, uh, markets in China on a holiday all week. And uh, yes, so uh, it's going to be pretty quiet there. South Korea also on a holiday. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. We are live at the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in L.A. talking with the biggest names in tech and media about massive changes that, the, that are underway in this industry. One company here, Discovery, which launched more than 30 years ago, but is working to stay current right now with major deals and new programming. David Zaslov, CEO of Discovery Communications, with me here now. David, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to see you. So you bought Scripps, you've bought Group 9. Why is Bigger Better? Well, we really don't see Bigger Better, but we, we do see the way people are consuming content is changing and the type of content people are consuming are changing. So the reason that we did Scripps is that they have great quality brands and they own all of their content. So we see it really as uh, we're acquiring 200,000 hours of IP and great brands that have really saturated the U.S. in a great way, HGTV and food and travel and, and cooking and DIY. But it really hasn't proliferated around the world. We launched some food and home channels around the world mm -hmm. and we're very successful. So we think with their brands and library, we could take it around the world. But more importantly, you know, as people start to consume content on all devices, you know, we can take a lot of that content and the content that we own. We're the largest uh, IP mm -hmm. media company in the world. We have more global brands than anyone else. So Discovery, Animal Planet, TLC, mm -hmm. OWN, Science. If we close on scripts, mm -hmm. food, HGTV, travel. Those we can provide everywhere in the world on every device because mm -hmm. we own everything on it. And so, you know, we see a, a, a an ecosystem that's in some kind of moderating uh, growth in some markets and some decline in others, but relatively healthy, mid-single digit versus uh, double digit or, or mid-teens mm -hmm. several years ago. But now we have a load of IP we could take direct to consumers on their phones. You know, ultimately, if you're interested in Italian cooking or cooking mm -hmm. or food, or if you love discovery or science, mm -hmm. we can deliver it right to you on your phone because we own all the content. When it comes to Group 9, are you seeing traction with a younger, more millennial audience there? So we're seeing huge traction in terms of the scale of, of consumption of, our, yeah. of, of the content on Group 9. Uh, it's over 6 billion uh, views a month. Uh, we're the largest provider of short form news on Facebook. You know, so those uh, that would see now this, uh, that's us. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's growing rapidly. It's not making money yet, but we are one of the largest providers on Facebook, which usually one or two minute uh, stories. Uh, we're also the largest, uh, uh, one of the largest providers on Snap. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's an, an almost full millennial audience. And so we have our traditional business where we're taking content around the world an hour, a half hour, mostly on channels. We'll now be able to take that direct to consumer either in bundles or individually. Uh, but we have this short form studio effectively with Group 9 where we're the number one or two or three player in the world in terms of short form content. And it was helpful to us even as Facebook was looking to build mid form content, series that are four, five or six minutes. We were able to get a lot of those series because we're already a top provider to Facebook. The challenge is it's, it's not making money yet. Right. So we have huge scale and we have great name recognition and, and brand awareness but now we have to take it. And we're working with Facebook, we're working with Snap on how we really monetize that. So speaking about the need to make money, there's been speculation about job cuts coming with the Scripps acquisition. How many jobs? I mean, what kind of efficiencies are you working through? Well, we really look at it as two things. Uh, yes, there's going to be significant synergies. I mean, we've stated about 350 million. We think there could be more than that. But it's really, the idea is we have two great companies that do quality content. When we put them together in the U.S. alone, we'll have more than 20% of viewership on cable. Uh, and we have, you know, five of this of the top six or seven women's networks with ID and OWN and TLC and HGTV and food. But we're then going to invest a lot more in content and going direct to consumer. So we really view the company as if we can, if we close on this acquisition or when we do, as being kind of a breaking it in half. Mm -hmm. The right side is growth, mm -hmm. and that's owning more IP, providing that content in different ways on different devices in all languages all around the world, and getting more viewership, more scale, uh, more more people spending more time with us. How the left side is cost, and we have to attack that. And we think that we can do, we could really do a good job of attacking that. And we would have needed to do that even if right. we didn't do scripts, because the industry is changing. And do you see doing more deals? Will, will you be doing more M&A? 
Sure. I mean, I think, you know, we've said that we think Scripps is a very good deal for us, mm -hmm. but one of the big attractions is we pick up more IP, mm -hmm. more quality brands, but 18 months after we close, we'll be less than three and a half times levered, and then we'll be, you know, a $35 billion company with a bigger balance sheet so we can go out and buy more of the stuff that we're going to need so that we can be more successful in the future. Speaking of sports, we've seen Amazon and Facebook non-traditional players pay up for sports rights. Right. What, what's next that they could get? Well, look, they're in the marketplace, and uh, we're actually working with both of them. Mm -hmm. Amazon, in particular, we're doing a lot of work with. Uh -huh. We have a direct-to-consumer product already. We've been at it for about a year and a half, almost two years, in Europe. We're the leader in sports in Europe with Eurosport, where we have the traditional ESPN-type business, where we have Eurosport as three sports channels in every country uh, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But our model in Europe is a little bit different than the sports models in, in, mm -hmm. in most other countries around mm -hmm. the world. It, one, we're, we, we have a dominant position on linear, where we're the only pan-European player. But all the sports that we've acquired, the Olympics through 2024, tennis, cycling, uh, handball, football in a number of markets. We own all that IP for all platforms. And so most sports platforms buy the rights just for linear or the cable channel. So if you go to Europe in a year and, and Vodafone or Deutsche Telekom or BT are selling rights to see the French Open or to see the Olympics or to see Tour de France, they're buying it from us. Mm -hmm. And so we're way long on sports IP. We have Eurosport that's profitable, but mm -hmm. we think over the next couple of years, we'll be able to sell to the super fans of tennis and cycling and the Olympics and Olympic sports, and we'll be able to go direct to consumer in a much more scalable fashion. We're already getting some real traction. How many sports free direct to consumer TV packages will there be by the end of the year? Um, in Europe right now, in most markets, it's mm -hmm. just us. Yep. There are a couple of the bigger markets like Germany uh, and the UK where there are more. But in most markets right now, it's just us and we got a great jump on it. I think that more and more, when if, if somebody loves squash, we have all the squash. Mm -hmm. If somebody loves a, a speed skating or tennis, mm -hmm. you know, that will be, I think, a very attractive model because people, mm -hmm. the way you would buy a magazine if you love golf or tennis or cycling, mm -hmm. You know, across Europe, 750 million people, all the people that love a particular sport will be able to buy that from us and yeah. get all of it. All right, David Zaslav, CEO of Discovery. Always great to have you here on Bloomberg. Thanks great so to much see you. For Thanks so by. much. All right. Well, Paul Odolini, the former CEO of Intel, has died at the age of 66. Odolini joined Intel in 1974 and served as uh, the company's chief executive from 2005 until he retired in 2013. He made his name overseeing the introduction of the Pentium processor. Current Intel CEO Brian Grzanek said Odolini was, quote, the relentless voice of the customer in a sea of engineers, and he taught us that we only win when we put the customer first. The private equity firm TPG collected $2 billion for its global impact fund, dubbed the RISE Fund. The move taps the growing demand for impact investing, creating the largest pool of its kind. The fund is also co-led by the likes of musician-turned-investor Bono and billionaire Jeff Skoll, formerly of eBay. Earlier in a Bloomberg exclusive, I caught up with TPG Growth founder and RISE Fund CEO, Bill McGlashan and started by asking about impact investing and how to make sure you're not diminishing financial returns. We are actively looking for investments in the key sectors where we're, where we're pursuing opportunities within the RISE Fund that generate both financial return and impact. Uh, both priorities and these are businesses where the inherent nature of the business is that which generates the impact so these are collinear priorities across impact and return so how do you measure impact and in measuring impact make sure you're not decreasing your financial returns yeah no that's a great great question we uh, spent a year and a half when we started this fund when Bono uh, Jeff Skoll and I started the Rise Fund. We spent a year and a half working with Bridgespan as a partner to understand whether we could actually measure impact. And after a lot of work, we concluded, in fact, we had a credible way of both underwriting impact, tracking it during the course of our investment, ultimately reporting on it, and we brought KPMG in to provide assurance 
of impact. And in each case, in each company we go into, we look for a way to, to measure the monetary value of the social or environmental impact the company's providing. And we do that in parallel with the investment return underwriting that we would traditionally do. So at the end of the day, we're first and foremost making sure these are good investments, but also, secondly, ensuring that these, these companies are going to deliver a real, measurable outcome. Tell me a bit of the story. What attracted someone like Bono to this, or Jeff Skoll of eBay? Well, these are, in fact, every one of the founders' board members are people, those two in particular as my co-founders, are people who spent their lives focused on social and environmental impact. Jeff Skoll with his uh, efforts at Participant, um, he has his own impact fund that he was one of the original pioneers in, in launching uh, Capricorn. Um, so he's been a long-term uh, you know, leader in this field. Bono, with all of his work across Africa, first began investing about a decade ago when Mo Ibrahim, who's also on the Founders Board, encouraged him, if you're really serious about development, you have to invest to create scale. There are 15 million jobs needed this year in Africa and there are 15 million jobs needed next year and the year after just based on the demographics. And there's a general awareness that we're not going to get there in terms of solving these big social environmental problems unless we activate scalable, sustainable capital to achieve these ends. Why have a separate fund for this strategy versus TPG Growth, your other baby, and TPG Capital? So TPG Growth is the investing firm that's driving this. Our belief was in order to accomplish the impact priorities, we needed to add a incremental group of talent uh, necessary to do the work around impact and to drive the sector themes. And we wanted to attract people that wanted to co-found this, like Bono and Jeff and the other founding board members, Reed Hoffman, Loreen Jobs, uh, Richard Branson and the others that are part of it, uh, who wanted to create a new model uh, that could ultimately shape the way investing is done in this in the space, the impact space. My exclusive interview with TPG Growth founder and Rise Fund CEO Bill McGlash in there. All right, coming up, we bring you our coverage, more of it from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit. Walter Isaacson, CEO of the Aspen Institute, will be joining us to talk about Apple, Facebook, Twitter on the heels of all of this news coming out of Washington. This is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang live from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit. I also sat down with Walter Isaacson, CEO of the Aspen Institute, author of the best-selling book about Steve Jobs. We started our conversation by asking about uh, Snapchat. He was just on stage speaking with uh, Evan Spiegel, the CEO of Snapchat and Facebook. We talked about Snapchat, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all of it. Take a listen. Nowadays, Facebook and Amazon and Google in particular um, are so big and so creative and powerful that they could stymie competition. And it's always difficult to know how to, uh, to deal with that. Jeff Bezos has a wonderful line that Steve Jobs and others have said as well, is that you shouldn't be obsessed with your competitors, you should be obsessed with your customers mm -hmm. and the rest will follow. And I think that's what Snap is going to do, is follow the lead of the customer says, okay, I want to tell stories. Okay, I want this new feature. And as long as they keep innovating, they'll stay a step ahead of Facebook. Do you see a young Mark Zuckerberg and Evan Spiegel, or do you think they're not on the same plane? Oh, I think Evan Spiegel and Mark Zuckerberg are deeply creative people who have a real feel for what users would want. I found Evan Spiegel to be deeply philosophical, smart, and have a great sense of leadership, which is, to me, the hardest thing. I mean, to lead a public company, that's even more difficult than creating a product. That's where Steve Jobs stumbled at one point, was he created really great products, but in about 1985, he was having trouble leading a public company, an Apple. And I think Evan Spiegel's getting over that hump. I'm deeply impressed with Evan Spiegel. 
Facebook, Google, Twitter are in the crosshairs of the most important issues in the world right now. Fake news, the spread of misinformation, abuse. Correct. They're going before Congress now uh, in this Russia probe. Um, how serious is this? It's very serious, and people have responsibility in this war. When I first went online, it was many years ago, and there was a, uh, a service called The Well that was started by Stuart Brand and others. And the first words that came up were, you own your own words. In other words, you had to take responsibility for what you said. In the world now of Twitter and many other places, people can be anonymous. They can create fake news without any sense of responsibility on Facebook and um, Twitter. We saw that again happen in Las Vegas, but far worse, we saw it happen in the election. And I think the time has come where you can no longer say, oh, it's not our responsibility, we're just a platform. So how do they rise to that? What do they do? Well, it's easy. I mean, we've done it for 500 years, ever since Gutenberg invented the printing press, mm -hmm. which is people take responsibility for what they publish. Mm -hmm. Now, that involves having humans in the mix, mm -hmm. because with all due respect to artificial intelligence, algorithms can't do it mm -hmm. perfectly. You need to say, here are our values. Mm -hmm. You need to be able, people say, well, what's the difference between fake news and real news? And I say, if you have to ask that question, get out of the business. Mm -hmm. Go back to being a fisherman. YouTube and Gmail are now at the center of this. Google has just recently pulled Russia Today from their premium ad packages. We, we've talked less about Google, but what about Google? I think that one of the interesting things is that you want to balance the ability to have search where you can have somebody can do a search and it's neutral. It doesn't sort of say we're going to bias this, that, or the other. But you also have to stop people who are putting up in the news feeds that will be searched by Google things that you know are incorrect and done intentionally incorrect. Certainly as a you know a journalist, I know that we publish things that were incorrect in the mm -hmm. past, sometimes things that were biased. But it wasn't done for some ulterior secret motive and that's what's happening with fake news today. And I think you have to make that distinction if you're at Google. You have to say, all right, this thing about the Las Vegas shooter was just put up as pure fakery, and we have to find ways to get rid of that. If indeed Facebook, Twitter, Google swayed the election in, in one direction or another, I mean, what is the recourse for that? What are the consequences? Well, I think you have to look forward, mm -hmm. which is you have to say, in this new environment, we're lucky. We used to have gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Cronkite would say, that's the way it is. And most of the nation would say, OK, he's my gatekeeper. We're in a better world now, where I can go wherever I want, including you know, Russian sources, or Syrian sources, mm -hmm. or Palestinian sources, to get the news. But we have to say, you can't use our platform to intentionally mislead people and as Mark Zuckerberg has said recently, we get it now. We kind of didn't do that all that well. And I suspect the people at Google are also have good values and are smart enough to figure out going forward we're going to have to do it better. Regulators are stepping in, especially in Europe. Do you think there's a reckoning coming for Facebook and Google? I think Facebook in Europe in Google particular there's a Apple. reckoning coming. I'm not somebody who's deeply in favor of mm on-the-spot regulations mm -hmm. and government agencies trying to regulate information. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really bad mm -hmm. idea, which is why I think it's a really good idea for Google and Facebook to step up and do it themselves. So, so, is it, so not law, self-policing, you think, is what's necessary? I, I think when you start having government laws telling you what information can flow, you're in a really bad place, mm -hmm. which is why people who, who do get involved in the industry of the flow of information have to have certain values mm -hmm. so that we don't have people saying we need the government to regulate the flow of information. I'm against the government regulating mm -hmm. the flow of information. It certainly requires a lot of trust in these companies, though. It does, and they've lost that trust. And I think when they lose that trust, it's bad for them. So they should be trying to regain the trust. And I think they are trying to regain the trust. Walter Isaacson there, CEO of the Aspen Institute. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Wednesday's show, we will be hearing from the CEO of Sonos on how the company is dealing with competition with Apple and Google and much, much more. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.